You're live. Live, laugh, love. Mm. <laughs> Today's theme was Redemption Best Actress. So these are films that were nominated for Academy Awards for Best Actor Actress. <laughs> and the five we chose were Diana Ross in Lady Sings the Blues, Sigourney Weaver in Gorillas in the Mist, Ellen Burstyn in Requiem for a Dream, Hoopy Goldberg for The Color Purple, and Angela Bassett for What's Love Got to Do With It. And the other names that I gave you that you uh, didn't put on there were Judy Garland for A Star is Born and Jim Fonda for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? So with 36% of the votes, Angela Bassett's performance and What's Love Got to Do With It won. Should we talk about who all these ladies lost to? Uh, you, it, yes, go ahead. Who did Diana Ross lose to? Liza Minnelli for Cabaret. Sigourney Weaver. Uh, she lost to Jodie Foster for The Accused. Ellen Burstyn. Julia Roberts for Aaron Brockovich. Hoopy uh, lost to Geraldine Page for The Trip to Bountiful. And then, of course, Angela Bassett lost to Holly Hunter for The Piano. Who did you vote for? Sigourney Weaver. Okay, so I've seen all of these films. Most of them, I think all of them, it's been years and years and years, except for maybe Lady Sings the Blues, because these are all depressing-ass movies. Yeah, I mean... Gorillas in the Mist would have been the easiest watch. The, the lightest fare. I haven't seen Requiem for a Dream. Oh, it's depressing. I probably would have voted for Sigourney just because I've been saying I want to watch Gorillas in the Mist again. But um, Angela Bassett's a great choice. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I haven't watched this in over 15 years for sure. Probably since I was at home as a kid with my parents. I don't think I've watched this since college in like 1997. So it's been, yeah, well over 25 years. And we, dis we just did a live for another Brian Gibson film, The Josephine Baker Story. So the director of this film directed The Josephine Baker Story. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when Tina Turner died, people were saying we should review this film, but I thought in light of her comments about not wanting to be seen as an abused woman. Well, this defining her. And this defining her, I didn't think it made sense to review this movie in honor of her death or life. But no, we, we could have done auntie, her as Auntie Entity, though, in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Yeah, I don't recall loving that movie. It's okay. It's fun. Okay, what's love got to do with it? The story of singer Tina Turner's rise to stardom and how she gained the courage to break free from her abusive husband, Ike Turner. Um... Straight out the gate, what do you think about this movie? I think it's excellent, and it's really hard to watch. <laughs> like, I was on edge the whole time. It, it, I likened it to watching a World War II movie. Is it 1945 yet? I'm like, what year is it? When is she leaving him? <laughs> it's, it's a hard watch, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so the highlights of the story are that Tina Turner, uh, as a child, is living in Nutbush, Tennessee, when her mom abandons her. Mm -hmm. So she lives with her grandmother. And then several years later, as a teenager, her mom sends for her. Um, so Tina's real name is Anna Mae Bullock. Anna moves to St. Louis, Missouri. And that's where she's with her mother and her older sister. And it's in St. Louis, Anna meets Ike Turner. And he's already a professional musician. He scoops her up, sees her talent, and they become Ike and Tina. And they have a pretty successful career, but it's clear that he's limited. Yeah. And his musical style, like he's not really changing with the times. He's very controlling. He's physically and verbally abusive to her. He has money management issues. He's, so He's addicted to drugs. Addicted to drugs. And he's a dickhead. So eventually, because uh, their career starts in the 60s, but by the mid-70s, Tina breaks free. And then the end of the film is, and then gets a divorce. And at the end of the film, we see her preparing to uh, launch her album, Private Dancer, which was not her first solo album, but it is her first very successful one. Mm -hmm. So it sold millions of copies, won Grammys, and the rest is history. Um, yeah. I, since I need to get into the practice of writing pull quotes, I did write one for this movie. Oh, <laughs> Well, just so I can say what I think. I wrote, What's Love Got to Do With It is a classic and should be used as the blueprint for this sort of sweeping biopic. 
superb acting, a strong script, excellent production value, and access to the artist material. In contrast to something like Angela Bassett directing that Whitney Houston biopic for Lifetime, it's like, you know, that was not it. Well, or Casey Lemon's Whitney, I just wanted to Or that, somebody. or we were naming other things like- uh, Respect for respect, Aretha. Or that David Bowie- Stardust. The crime with the David Bowie one was that that performance didn't really exemplify why that person became a huge star. Well, Johnny Flynn is nothing like David Bowie. I think, I mean, everything I said, but like Angela Bat, I kept thinking if Tina Turner were not a real person and you watch this movie, you would still feel like that this character is a star and this actor portraying her is a star. Mm -hmm. That's what really sends it. Well, yeah, I think me. didn't Tina tell her that Angela found her inner Tina? Yeah, yeah she embodied what it was like to be this woman, this very talented, beautiful woman. Yeah, I, I think the film's nearly perfect. Nearly. Yeah, I, I th it's pretty damn good. You, th It's just, we also don't, I think the point is we don't get biopics like this a lot. Everything's heavily sanitized. I think sometimes people are too close to uh, or have a certain reverence for the subject where they don't want to talk about the warts and all. And, yeah. and nobody has a PG-13 life. There should not be a PG-13 biopic in, in any regard, not even for fucking Shirley Temple. No PG-13 biopic. Word. Oh. Uh, so the film opens with a quote, which is the chant, that, like the Buddhist chant she does, mm -hmm. no, no myo renge kyo. And then it talks about how it's like how the lotus flower will, will bloom even when it's buried so deep in the mud, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we know that later on in her life, she adopted the Buddhist practice. And we get sort of a montage of her starting to become a Buddhist. And that, from my perspective, seemed like that's what gave her the strength to leave Ike mm -hmm. or, the, or the clarity to, to know that she needed to. Um, so the film starts off cute because we see little Anna in church and that little actor, the little girl was cute because she's singing, but clearly she's singing with a different energy than what the church wants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the- Go figure. And the choir director I recognized, she is the mother from Soul Food. Mm -hmm. um, she snatches her out of church. But, um, you know, everyone talk, I mean, we'll talk about it, but, you know, everyone talks about how awful Ike is and like, he's kind of like a meme, right? But- Anna's mama wasn't shit either. Oh, Jennifer, <laughs> Jennifer Lewis, uh, who's only a year older than Angela Bassett. Jennifer Lewis and Angela Bassett are effectively the same age. And Jennifer, once again, is playing someone's mama. Too young to be the mom. Uh, but but she does a good job. But And I get exactly who she is the minute Jennifer Lewis pops up on screen. Yeah, but her mama ain't shit because yeah. she abandons her. Then she sends for her years later and acts like, I mean, she tells her, you're not going to live under my house to make me feel bad. Then she sells her out to Ike Turner. Like, more than once. Yep. Uh, her grandmother is played by Coralie Day, who is the uh, matriarch in Daughters of the Dust. Mm. I mean, she's just only, in, she's effectively just in one scene, but. The, the grandmother. Mm -hmm. That was a sad scene though, because Anna sees her mom leaving and. With her sister. With her sister and the mom is screaming like, I can't do it. And the grandma's like, what about Anna? And then you see the truck just like skirt <laughs> off, like to hell with that girl yeah but you know it's a psychological uh template for explaining why she stayed yeah well and anna tina is painted like very naive because when she first first meets him the other ladies around are saying like ike's got a reputation and anna says well not by the way he looks and it's like girl are you blind that man looks <laughs> He does not look like he has good intentions. Oh, no, not, not, not at all. So there's the scene early on when Ike is singing in the club, Anna meets him in, and there's another woman on stage singing with Ike, and she keeps screaming. I thought that was funny because that lady was acting a fool, kind of the way Sherry Shepard does on her talk show. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I don't mind. Like, I can't control myself. Mm -hmm. Ike was cold. Because there's, you know, he's he's a manipulator. So okay. at first he's trying to make her feel like she's safe. And the first night she spends at his house, he's like, don't worry, I have a room in the back. I'll set it up. You'll be fine. I'll call your mom, let her know. But then he goes, he's getting close to her. And it seems like maybe he wants to kiss her. 
and he's telling her to open her mouth. So Anna opens her mouth, like thinking they're going to kiss. And he's like, girl, you got cavities. We need to send you to the dentist. <laughs> so her breath must have smelled bad. Mm -hmm. Like, damn. But he was, the the script and uh, Lawrence Fishburne do a really good job of showing how a woman like her would initially feel safe with him. Mm -hmm. But then as the audience, it becomes clear so fast that he isn't. And then like you mentioned, because we already know her story and I've seen this movie, but even if you didn't, the tension building up to when things are going to start to get really bad. I mean, it's not until the 55 minute mark that he hits her for the first time. But I feel like even if I didn't know the story, I would be anxious that entire time thinking like this is not. You can tell things aren't right. Yeah. So I think the script did a very good job of that. But and I read that the script by Kate Lanier, who wrote uh, the script for Set It Off and Glitter. Oh, and beauty shop. Uh, sh they toned down. Well, they made a lot of changes, which I'm sure we'll get into. But they toned down the violence that is in uh, detailed in, which is in Itina, which is breathtaking to think about. That this movie is like sort of like a, a watered down version of this woman's life is insane. But speaking of uh, not having a PG-13 life, we see a moment where. I keep saying Anna. Tina Turner's in bed with Ike earlier on. And, a, well, no, she's not in bed with him. Tina's asleep on her own when one of Ike's uh, other ladies, Lorraine, wakes her up with a gun to her head and then ultimately goes into the bathroom and shoots herself. She doesn't die, but... And Lorraine is the mother of at least two of Ike's children. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was... There are so many scenes in this movie that are really hard to sit through. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have to talk about the hair because the scene where Anna, well, Ike tells the background dancers, like, go make Tina look like this billboard, this like blonde white lady. And then we see Tina sitting in the chair with the shit in her hair and it's looking orange. And already it's like, this is not good. And then the poor shampoo girl who looks like she's 12 goes to like shampoo and Tina looks worried. And then the minute she touches her hair, it's like, it's just falling out. And that's the reason why she wore wigs, mm -hmm. which of course um, became her trademark. But um, one of the background singers tells the shampoo girl, <laughs> now you know you need your ass whooped for this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. Oh my gosh. The first time Tina hears her song on the radio with Ike and Tina, that like the DJ says Ike and Tina, but because she's not used to that, she thinks the DJ is saying Akatina. I thought that was really funny. And I don't know if I would have caught that without subtitles. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then it as de it's depicted as she's hearing it for the first time while she's after she's just given birth and she's anemic. So she's a little out of it. And the doctor is telling Ike she needs to be bedridden for three weeks in the hospital. She is very sick. And what does Ike do? Break her out of the hospital with this newborn baby. And then tells her, let's go to Mexico and get married. Like, he treated her like a mule. Cattle, yeah. Like like a workhorse. Yeah. Uh, that doctor, uh, Barney Shabaka Henley, you've seen him in a ton of stuff. But... Yeah. You made a comment that I think is funny. And obviously, being in an abusive relationship and getting out of it is not as easy as just, you know, making a decision. But... You know, Angela Bassett looks so muscular <laughs> in this movie. So it's just, it's kind of distracting to think like she could have whooped his ass I if think, she wanted to. I think she could take I Just as a funny observation, not that that would have helped at all. but No, but it, it is cathartic in the limo when she does finally strike back. It is. Yeah, that moment, which it takes us like an hour, 32 minutes to get to it, was such a relief. And again, not even knowing how the story would unfold. I, I think I still would have been um, so relieved to see her fight back. Not that violence is the no. answer, but some people need their asses whooped, and I definitely needed his. Well, <laughs> he did, and it's a sign of, like, somebody's had enough. Yeah. So, you know? I mean, even though it's very gruesome, like, seeing them after walking to the hotel is like, oh, my God. But And nobody's calling the police. No. And then, I mean, I got emotional several times, but I think the most emotional moment is when she... So that night that they have the big fight in the limo and then she decides she's leaving, she runs across the street to like a cheap motel 
and tells the hotel manager, like, I'm Tina Turner. I got into a fight with my husband. I only have pennies and like a gas card. If you help me, I promise I'll pay you back. And the man, and then she's about to take off a ring and the man's like, no, no, it'll be my pleasure. That was really emotional. Like that this woman needed help and someone was there for her. And seemingly left her alone. Like go up to, like, here's a room, go do what you need do to do. Do what you need to do, which is sometimes what people need. But then Vanessa Bell Calloway plays one of the background dancers who's also Tina's friend. I think her name's Carrie. Yeah, and she's an amalgamation, I think, of several, several people. people. But, yeah. but I thought that that character and that performance from Vanessa Bell Calloway was very powerful, too, because she does a really good job of letting her friend know this is not right. I'm not going to sit here and watch you do this. Like, that man hit me one time. I'm out of here. But then she comes back and tells her, like, I just need you to know I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. And Tina does end up going to her. And which also leads to a funny scene where they both pretend to be Ike and they're both sort of joking around how abusive he is. But then we see Tina get upset about it. That's a really interesting scene. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that that they both kind of do this play acting about. <laughs> it's, it's a kind of a way of processing. And it reminded me of that interview with Viola Davis and Oprah uh, where they're talking about Viola's memoirs. And there's that scene where they kind of have this bonding moment over knowing what it's like to live with rats in the walls. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Jesus Christ. But that's also the moment um, when... Carrie introduces Tina to Buddhism and chanting and meditation. But before that, um, the Anna, well, no, it's after that, that Anna ODs, like she's had enough. A suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. There's a suicide attempt. And then we see, uh, this is before, that we see uh, Carrie show up to the hospital to tell her she's there for her. So I said it's nearly perfect. I think one thing that needed some polish is while I'm super grateful that they had access to like the artist material, the lip syncing and the audio were slightly off to me. I'm, you know, they put Angela through the ringer with this because she only had a month to prepare to get yeah. in shape to learn her mannerisms. And Tina re recorded all of these songs for the production. And so, learn, you know, so she had to learn these versions of these songs to lip sync to. I mean, it, it was a tall order, but sure. Angela's performances like on stage are fantastic. I think she nailed the choreography, like the mannerisms, but I think the lip syncing, it is a little off. You can tell in some scenes, yeah. but that is for lots of biopics about singers. That's almost always kind of the main complaint. Uh, you don't get that with Fishburne because he's doing his own vocals. Uh, it, well, strangely, I thought that biopic with that British lady doing Whitney Houston, who wore the flipper, mm -hmm. I actually thought they did a really, I mean, I didn't think that movie was good, but the 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 vocals were very well done because that woman can sing. Yeah. So she, they blended her voice with Whitney's actual voice. So that movie, the only good thing about it, I think, are the vocals. But they're like, there's one thing we can uh, do for this film is, is get that part right. <laughs> right. Like, that's all it did. But this movie got everything else right. But that is a little weak to me. Um, and then oh, we forget Richard T. Jones shows up as Ike Jr. in a very early role for him. Yes. Uh, Candy Alexander is one of the Rockettes. Yes. Uh, 93 was a big year for her. I always think of her as... Uh, Carrie Washington's mama and scandal, but she was also in Poetic Justice that year and Menace to Society. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's the one who, yeah, she's in Poetic Justice. Well, so now there's a link because who plays Ike's son? Richard T. Jones. He's in two movies with Janet Jackson. The Why Did I Get Married films. And he's he's the abusive one to Jill Scott in those. So he got it from Ike. He got it from Ike. He, got <laughs> he the, learned that shit from Ike. He got the Ike bug. <laughs> uh, and then you get a flash of Larry Edwards, the... Uh, notable tina impersonator and drag artist mm -hmm. yeah um so the famous scene with lawrence fishburne forcing angela to eat the cake you know the quote is always like eat the cake anime but he doesn't tell that to her like i feel like that's one of those like movie moments where everyone just sort of makes it something different but he's not the one who says that it's his friend who's that actor I don't recall. That man wasn't shitty. He either. ain't shit. Yeah, just sat you there. You just watched this man abuse this lady all the time, and you don't even try. We don't even get a sense of him being like, hey, maybe you should. And and he's annoyed that he has to deal with the trauma of the situation, it's insinuating that if you just ate the damn cake, we would not have to sit here and do this. 
Well, and then, yeah. And then that that was a gasp when he slaps uh, Vanessa Bell Calloway. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. But it's the other guy who says, um, Anna Mae, just eat the cake, please. So that's mm -hmm. the line. So I think it's funny that we all make it seem like it's Ike saying, eat the cake, Anna Mae. Uh, the scene at the Ritz, where which is also fabricated, but where Ike pops up in her dressing room right before she's about to go. With a gun. Line, it's I wrote down, is no one looking out for me? Is no, no, no one's watching the door. You know what it makes me think of? All those clips of Beyonce on the Renaissance tour, because she's having a lot of like technical production issues, it seems, in every show. Like there's always something that goes wrong. But she's very vocal about saying, like, someone needs to turn my fan on. Who didn't move this? I that was what I was thinking with that moment. Like, I know I well, knowing Tina, she was so damn passive that she didn't say anything. Probably. <laughs> I would have caused a scene. Who let I in Who, here? Okay, I'm gonna go do my show. Every y'all, y'all are fired. I guess like like Robert Downey Jr. firing his team after Doolittle. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> when Anna ODs and Ike is in the ambulance and he's telling her like, bitch, if you dot, like if you don't, basically if she, if she doesn't make it, he's going to kill her. <laughs> what motivation? He's a monster. Yes. <laughs> um, But you know, and he had a hard life too, not to make excuses for him, but in his contributions to rock and roll, you know, he, he also, it, it's immediate. We can tell that he's somebody that feels he's, his reputation has been neglected. He doesn't, and he's he been slighted. His, he doesn't have the credit he's deserved. And I believe that he, he didn't have that. Something I was confused by is at the end when Tina meets with that white record guy, producer guy, and he's asking her what kind of music she wants to make. She says, I want to do rock and roll. I don't like the slow R&B stuff that I did with Ike. And I found that interesting because I'm not, I mean, I'm familiar with her catalog, but a lot of her music with Ike was higher energy. Mm -hmm. So I kind of was a little confused why she's saying she doesn't like all that slow stuff. And then when we see her at the Ritz with her, private dancer record and we know it like like private dancer what's love got to do with it both of those songs are like slower sleepy songs mm -hmm. so it didn't quite match what she said she wanted to do so that was i would have liked some now years later watching the documentary tina which we reviewed she does talk about how those songs were like in the documentary, like how those weren't exactly this, like she had to really be pushed to record those songs because mm -hmm. they weren't the rock and roll she wanted. So I know that she was staying true to what she wanted despite recording those songs. But in this movie, it does seem like there's a disconnect with what she's saying and what she did. Yeah, sure. I do like the Phil Spector moment because that that's, I don't know if that's my favorite song, but I listen to it a lot. It's a good running song. Uh, River Deep, Mount High. It is. And then, to, is, you know, Celine Dion did that song and it's like... Mm, Not the same. You should have left that alone. <laughs> like, well, so I, Celine, don't get me wrong, is a fantastic singer, unparalleled even. But, you know, some of her, like the heart cover too. Is like, I think the problem with Celine is her instrument is like on another level. Mm -hmm. But I think when she tries to seem soulful and do her runs and her riffs, it sounds like a joke. And then also like, her as a person like well yeah, i think we know kind of about your personal life a little right bit, and it's like you you with that old white canadian i don't know and she's probably a lesbian from what so, i've heard so it's like oh but to me it's like britney spears like you sing about all this shit and it's like aren't you on house arrest on and medicated you're not flying to france to go to dance parties like what like, why yeah. are you singing about this yeah you are not surviving at the club girl anyway i'm gonna get in trouble for that uh what would you give this movie um four and a half I would give this film four and a half out of five. It's definitely a classic. It's nearly perfect. Um, yeah. Uh, what I did want to talk about is I think watching this movie in the 90s, and then I think just like culturally, the way people talk about it is almost like it's a joke. Like, oh, oh, oh okay, Ike. Like, he's like the poster child for all like abusers. I mean, I mean, he's probably, well, I don't know who surpassed, I mean, Chris Brown and then maybe OJ for a minute, but like Ike Turner was always sort of the poster child for that. And I think 
you know, even with Kiki Palmer doing like Tina Turner impressions, I, I feel like this movie and those performances when I was younger, I always felt like kind of like a joke. Well, because it's easier to joke about this than to take it seriously. But watching it yesterday with a different lens, like very well done, very powerful. Like, yeah, this is not a joke. Like, this is a very serious film that like took us to a place that oftentimes these sorts of movies, because this a movie was originally intended to be for TV. Mm -hmm. So to think that, I mean, it's it's very impressive. I agree. But yes, it, it wasn't a joy to sit through on Friday afternoon as ne uh, none of the films in this poll did were, but uh, we're going to have to watch the color purple, color purple twice because, well, I'm going to watch the original before the remake comes out in December. Well, the remake is going to be very different from the original. It, it is, but it's not like it's, you know, inherently light material. <laughs> no, but you know, uh, I saw the color purple on Broadway twice with Fantasia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it is very different from the movie. So I, I think the, the new movie is going to be closer to the musical, which is obviously very emotional, but I think the music helped. Sure. Well, it's uh, uh, some levity, some, some catharsis to it's escapist, right? We can, yes. Our mind can go somewhere else. Um, but, oh, and we should talk about Angela for a second, who's getting, uh, receiving an honorary Oscar this year, because uh, this is her first of two Academy Award nominations. And, you know, I'm sure that the voting body of the Academy felt in 1993 that, that she was lucky enough to get a nomination. Because <laughs> Holly Hunter, I do really like the Holly Hunter performance in the piano. And of course, that had all of the buzz behind it. That was a, a won the Palme d'Or, the first time a woman won that award. And then Holly Hunter won uh, Best Actress at Cannes for that. So all that momentum was there behind her for that. But, you know, in a perfect world, this Oscar nomination for Angela Bassett would have led to other roles of the same caliber where she would continually be in contention for that. And well, the, maybe, maybe not. I mean, look at Halle Berry. But the same, it's the same problem it, that the Oscars work. That's a mechanism that works for white people. You know, I think Angela may have dodged a bullet with that because she's had a very impressive career She has, and she's been able to sort of be in her own class without the uh, distinction of being this Academy Award winner and feeling like she can't take roles that are beneath that. Sure. So I think she's, you know, she's not my favorite actor, but I think she's very talented and um, she certainly has made a very impressive career for herself. So she didn't need that Academy Award. She didn't, but you know, the Oscar, they had one, Barbara Streisand and Katherine Hepburn tied one year, I think in 67. I don't understand why, like, maybe at least one decade, like, once a time a decade, you can get some ties. Because, like, Liza and Diana, that, that could have been a tie. Yeah. I, at Sigourney for Gorillas in the Mist, like, at the Golden Globes that year, she won two for Working Girl because they fucked her over, screwed her over for Working Girl as well. Uh, but at the Golden Globes that year, they had a three-way tie at the Globes for Best Actress in a Drama. It was... Shirley, Jody, and Sigourney. I'm also thinking, get, getting back to Angela dodging a bullet, you know, I've heard Monique, who won for Precious, yeah. and Halle Berry, who won for Monsters Ball, like, them talking about getting the Academy Awards and how it really hindered their career, hmm. and feeling like, you know, they didn't want to take certain roles because it, they weren't up to the certain caliber. Again, I feel like Angela may not have had the amazing career she's had if she would have won this Academy Award. Because then there are all those expectations. Because she's done some stuff that's like, well, right, right. why would you do that? But then it's also like, because she can. So I mean, Strange Days, I think, is a great underrated film. The Catherine Bigelow with Ray Fiennes and Julia Lewis. Like, Angela is the highlight of that. But it, And that's worth a watch if you've never seen it. I'll go through the comments. Someone said they watched our reviews for Nine Perfect Strangers and they felt so bad for both of us. <laughs> I think we were both very cranky. I was so frustrated with Nine Perfect Strangers. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a second season coming out with Nicole Kidman returning in that accent. Gorillas in the Mist wrecked me. Is that a sad movie? Yes. What's so she, sad about it? She gets her head cut off. What? Sigourney dies? <sighs> you need to read. I thought that lady was still alive. No, you're thinking of the uh, woman with the chimps, uh, Jane. Uh, what's her name? No. Uh, oh, I'm genuinely this is a genuine reaction i thought that that lady what's her name diane fossey diane fossey is, is still alive no she's dead 
Oh. Yeah, they never found her murderer. She's murdered in Rwanda. That's why when I read this comment, I'm like, what's so sad about it? I'm like, oh, she she's killed? Yeah, and she kind of lost her mind up there in the mountain. Oh, what do we do? What do we just watch? Fear of a Black Hat, where they uh, aren't they recording their album is um, Gorilla Gorillas in the Midst. M I D S T. I really enjoyed that. I love your kitchen. Thank you. Sigourney should have won for Aliens or Working Girl. She lost Alien. You know the, the again. Was I mean, she nominated for Aliens? Yeah. Oh, that, who won that year? Marley Matlin for Children of a Lesser God. Which is a good performance, and uh, the, you'd never had a hearing impaired uh, actor win that award. The only one other has uh, in the nearly forty years since then. But uh, I think the attitude for her Aliens nomination was very much the same. Of you're lucky to be here for a genre film that she should have won. Someone's listening to us while they're in the garden. They like how we have been sharing our Rotten Tomatoes pull quotes. Oh yeah, so I, so for those who don't know, now I'm Rotten Tomatoes approved. Uh, but part of, you know, I've been looking through a lot of different reviews and I, ours is the only one that says like YouTube. So I guess that's like a newer thing. Although there are critics I see who they're using their YouTube reviews for Rotten Tomatoes, but like our specifically, well, for me, for you, you have Spin and Eye on Cinema as well. Mm -hmm. But for me, it says YouTube. Like, that's okay. I feel like a bastard child in there. You, but anyway, we've gotten the distinction. I had to do the application for you, but. Yes, you want credit. You're, thank you. Um, you're welcome. The, uh, <laughs> although I didn't know you did it until after, um, but well, it, they require pull quotes and so, we all know how I talk. It's all over the place. So I, it, I had a very hard time backlogging mm -hmm. because I never actually say in a complete sentence what I think about anything. <laughs> so now I have to do that. So moving forward, all of our videos will have us saying what we think about the film. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, a, it's I don't necessarily love or feel like I need to keep up with Rotten Tomatoes, but it is a legitimizing factor that gives you access because, um, you know, it, it, studios can use that as an excuse not to uh, give you access to materials. So yeah, um, I do agree that this the the formatting of what's love got to do with it feels like a TV movie. Sure, um, which is why I think this could be a blueprint for those types of movies. Like it needs to have some production value and some good acting. Like well, and Josephine Baker's story did have both of those things at least too. It it, it did. I, I think the script was a bit of a mess, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, definitely that felt elevated as well. I agree, Vanessa Bell Calloway. I just she just she does such a good job of almost seeming kind of zen. Mm -hmm. Cuz even earlier on like in the midst of all the chaos, like her face and her presence always felt kind of like we're going to be Grounded. okay. Mm -hmm. Oh. I've mentioned this before when you reviewed the Tina doc, but when I was working at Blockbuster, they tried to put this on the Valentine's Day display and I kept taking it down and was written up. Yeah, this is not... Imagine. So someone put it up there because of the title. Yes, and they weren't paying any... Because I was... Well, you did an article for Spin uh, about like anti-love movies. This would have been a good one. No, I took it off the list. Why? Because I thought it would have been disrespectful. Oh, because she had just passed? No, because uh, it's a... Oh, because it's about... Well, yeah, okay, I, I take that back. This is not a good choice. I mean, but it, it's kind of funny and a morbid. It, there's, there's a more... There, yes, there's a subversive, morbid... I'm going to get canceled now. ...humor to that, but I felt that for that piece, it was too disrespectful amongst all... And I think... But then I think I picked um, Why Do Fools Fall in Love to have... So, so there's a, a, a good mix of things in there, but... Which is not, then that's a true story too, but someone watched this as, as a kid. Yeah, I do think the abuse portrayed is intense for young eyes. Yeah. Well, even you know, the in the the scene where the kids are seeing it happen and that little boy crying, like that shit's hard to watch. I find in many movies it's hard to portray the grandeur of a celeb, fictional or real. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's like you're not up to the level of the person you're portraying. So this is not working. But it's like the passion has to be there with the people, the, at least the main players to want to do it. I feel like 
a lot of things feel like the Aretha thing. We have the opportunity to do this and uh, who is really invested in this? Because somebody should have told Jennifer Hudson that that accent is no Gouda. Or like Mariah Carey playing herself and still couldn't. <laughs> and then you think Fantasia played herself in her biopic. And, and Life a, is not a fairy tale. Directed by Debbie Directed Allen. Directed by Debbie Allen. For a lifetime. For a lifetime. And who plays her mom? The lady from Rock? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she's in a movie we just reviewed with Denzel. Yes. Yeah, she's in the movie, uh, not Time Crimes. It's about time travel. Out of time? No, we just watched it. We watched it upstairs. Deja vu. Deja vu. Mm -hmm. She's in that movie too. Mm -hmm. I like that movie. You had to buy. You bought it for me like what? Fifteen years. You bought it a long time. Ago. I I had to buy that off of eBay. Uh, and it's like, like a, a, bootleg. a bootleg copy. <laughs> and the cover that the person selling it uh, had spelled tail, the wrong kind of tail. Life is not a fairy tale, like on, um, like, like like on my dog. <laughs> um, but I, yeah. But yeah, glitter, but which has the same screenwriter. That also makes me think Fantasia. Like, I always laugh thinking that Fantasia wrote a book, like about like her memoirs. But in the memoir, she says she's illiterate. <laughs> so you didn't write this book, or well, just on social media, where it's like you can tell when she has made the post. Illiteracy is not funny. No, it's not, and she has her GED. Although, um, I've I've said this many times before, but one time this was years ago, like. Cause I'm not known for like reading. And one time this lady, I'm not a known reader. I'm not a known reader. And <laughs> I was at work uh, once and a lady asked me like, Oh, um, she made a comment, like, kind of like, Oh, you should read more. And I said, well, I don't know how to read. <sighs> and that lady brought me a pamphlet on like the, like this adult education center, like, uh, like adult Ill illiteracy programs. Which I thought was funny because, A, like, I'm working, like, I can read, but also um, I can't read this pamphlet then. I don't know where to go. <laughs> she was trying to do her part. Uh, I think she was being shady. Probably, but, you know, she didn't have to do all that either. Yeah. Someone said they thought I said her name was Anime. Anime. <laughs> Anna May Bullock. Anime Sandra Bullock. Uh, yeah, it's funny thinking about all the people that were considered to play Tina including Whitney Houston, whose pregnancy got in the way of it, because that wouldn't have been good. No. Halle Berry's, no. Robin Givens, I do like Robin I Givens. I do, too. And she's a very uh, interesting, beautiful person to look at. I um, think they got the perfect person. I think they him. got they got what they needed. Oh, someone read that the Ramada employees had security placed outside her door. Oh. Where were those security at the Ritz? No. Well, you know, the other thing... Because I've worked with like high end guests before, and it's like you can't tell these people anything, mm -hmm. like, right? Because they'll they'll cause a scene, and they'll and it'll cost you money, right? Like, so you know, people with money and power and access, they know that they can get away with a lot of stuff. That's why Ike acted the way he did, because mm -hmm. he knew all these people around him relied on him, and so they're not going to tell him a damn thing. And yeah, the, there are a lot of uh, things smoothed over about their relationship. And, and and yeah, Tina wasn't a perfect person either. I mean, they're the first, the kid that we see her giving birth to, Ike wasn't the daddy of that kid. Yeah, but again, if Tina Turner weren't a real person and this were just a movie, I, I think it effectively told a story, even if it's not the actual story, even if they make Tina seem like an angel and they demonize this black man. I mean, th this is the story they're telling and I don't know what, what what's real or not. Well, but the, the, you know, baseline, he beat her and that's, it, you know, unfortunately that's what he's forever going to be known as, but it, he did it. I think Jennifer Lewis is cast older than she is because of her demanding voice. Yeah, well, she she has a very imperious quality about her, which reads older. It, yeah, and for then, sure. And all it all it is is really styling her a little bit, and she looked the same for years. Because even just rewatching Jackie's back, she looks exactly the same in that. But good for her. Like she definitely accepted. Like she has a lane, and she has you know made the most of it. Mm -hmm. Also in poetic justice, I do like Jennifer Lewis in like supporting roles. Like sprinkle her in. <laughs> 
Angela would have killed the Lady Macbeth role? Yes. You know, I, I really liked Joel Cohen's Tragedy of Macbeth, which I made you watch and you <laughs> didn't love so much. But um, yeah, I don't know that Francis and Denzel, it, 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 uh, I think Angela could have been, that would have been a lot more better casting, I think. But again, I like Francis. She's fine in that. But yeah, Angela would have killed Lady Macbeth. Oh God, the scene where Ike, like the first time we see him hit her and he drags her to the back of the house. I mean, that's like, uh, and the poor kids are watching like, like. Well, and, and then and then uh, Vanessa comes running in through the side door and telling her she's got to leave. And that's where you get a sense of Tina, because Tina didn't like the script for the movie. She thought it made her seem too much like a victim. and she maintained that she had control and it's like, well, that, which reminds me of Isabelle Huppert and L who is going to give herself to this rapist as a way to have control over the situation. It's like, well, that there is a level of victimization here that we just cannot be in denial of, but you get a sense in that scene where she's like, I need to, I can get it back on track where the energy's right, where he won't do this to me. Like that, that's my responsibility. That's how I have control. And it's like, <laughs> that's not how that works. Can we see, Joseph lip synced again by Janet? Probably not. Uh, do we watch Scandal? I watched Scandal. I watched like the first. You had a moment where you were addicted to that, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I probably watched the first five seasons. And you, and I mean, you like Tony Goldwyn. And I really like Tony Goldwyn. But you don't like uh, Kerry Washington. I do not like Kerry Washington. <laughs> I liked everything about Scandal except Carrie Washington. Except Olivia Pope. Uh -huh. Oh, my God. The character of Olivia Pope, we need her, but I did not like Carrie Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I watched all those episodes. Shonda Rhimes, I'm a sucker for, like, uh, good marketing uh, and good storytelling. Like, uh, even if it's hacky, like, oh, you, you're just, like, I know what you're doing. You're ma making me, like, wait for the next time. I eat that kind of stuff up. Mm -hmm. I love it. Or even like, um, like if I'm on Instagram or TikTok and I see like, we went to a coffee shop last Sunday in Los Feliz. Mm -hmm. Just because someone took some nice, like they had posted some nice video of it. Yeah. I'm like a sucker for that kind of stuff. What, did you like that coffee shop? Yeah. It was okay. I like the Easter Ray's more. Easter Ray's coffee shop is way better. Well, first of all, it's like, intended for people to like comfortably sit. The one we went to in Los Feliz was very like, you just walk by and with your loud ass dog and your stroller and get your overly priced cup of espresso it had, and walk out. Cause all of the seating. All of the seating felt like I was in um, an old Roman bath. <laughs> like it, like it felt like I was in a dried out <laughs> bath house. Like mm -hmm. very uncomfortable. It was all tiled and uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to name it cause it was cute for what it is. They sell books and yeah, the, the, and the books were interesting. A lot of Walter Mosley. If we lived in walking distance, I would go. But then, but I don't know because it's like you can't even like meet a friend there to like talk because the seating was so awkward. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, I wouldn't. You couldn't sit there and write. For instance, if I just want coffee, Marine. like if if I just need coffee in my hand without the cute space, I'll just go to McDonald's because I don't have to get out of the car. Sure. But I'm not like parking to walk to go get it and then go back. No, I'm not doing that. Uh, oh, is there a eat the cake reference in Drunken Love? You know, not in good taste. Uh, well, I didn't know that, but I don't really like that song. I don't either. But I, I'm not the biggest Beyonce fan. <laughs> I like it. There, she has, I mean, the catalog is very impressive and there, there are a lot, there are a lot of songs I like. Oh, if I post my top 25 most listened so, two songs, two of them are Beyonce mm -hmm. songs. And uh, I do have like, I think three right now on my gym playlist. Mm -hmm. I, she's super talented, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but I'm, I'm about to get a bunch of hate mail. Oh, also, the movie doesn't feel very period. It's uh, very much a movie shot and set in the early 1990s. Hmm. 
I don't have to, I didn't get that impression watching. Well, we're in so many interiors, which kind of made it feel <clears throat> a little more oriented for television. For I think bit. maybe, I mean, if I think about it more, maybe the period in the 70s doesn't feel as 70s uh -huh. as it could. Sure. So I could see that, yeah. Is that real? Robert Downey Jr. fired his team after that flop movie? I haven't researched it. You were listening to a podcast and they were talking about that. So I, it sounds like something dumb he'd do. But, and, and also like, sir, did you not read the script for this? Oh, thank you, Raina. She says, thank you for the awesome content. I just found out I'm pregnant and I can't wait for all the new reviews this next eight months. Oh, well, I assume that you're happy to be pregnant. So I'm happy for you. <laughs> I've learned not to assume, because like, you know, sometimes people will say they got a divorce and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And they're like, no, it's great. <laughs> oh, Tina's version of Disco Inferno. Pretty good, yeah. Oh, Tina was quoted as uh, saying that she hated how I had her screaming on all those records. <laughs> Private Dancer is a good song. Mm -hmm. It's a good um, album. Tina was bipolar and had a history of child abuse. Ike. I mean, oh, Ike, sorry. <laughs> Tina. Like, yeah, what? I think he, he was abused. And I, I know Fishburn had apparently turned on this role five times and thought the script didn't really uh, explain why he behaved the way he did. So I think that's why we ended up with the little mention about his dad's getting his holes kicked in his stomach for being with that gangster's girlfriend. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, a, a black man growing up when he did, you, there's trauma. There's trauma. And yeah, for sure. Uh, but so, I mean, with that in mind and just the nature of their lives together, I do think it's in really poor taste that, this story was kind of the butt of a joke for so long and i didn't someone saying that people are recreating scenes on TikTok. i haven't seen those but that's pretty like that's in poor taste but people, yeah you know that's pretty tacky. people need to learn the hard way of what that will do to them but have you seen johnny guitar oh yeah so have you uh nicholas ray joan crawford johnny guitar is actually played by sterling hayden there is a fantastic bitchy face off between mercedes mccambridge who did the voice of the exorcist and Joan Crawford, who would not allow herself to be shot outside by this time in the 50s. And there, there's a very famous story where Joan hated Mercedes so much that she had her Mercedes wardrobe taken strewn along the highway. Someone says it looks like I'm drinking a big glass of milk. I don't really drink milk. Um, I do consume dairy, but not a lot. But what about you like milk? I like I do with sweets. Do you want to talk about that? I don't know. You have such an aversion to me enjoying my time with sweets. <laughs> I've developed this hatred for Nick eating sweets because he always wants milk with it. I'm, and then it becomes this ritual. Well, yeah, because you kind of have to have the right balance. Because if I have too much, if I have a lot of leftover milk, well, that is going to make me eat So if sweets. he pours a glass of milk and he has a cookie, then there's more milk than cookie. So then he'll keep eating the cookies till the milk is done. Or if he grabs a piece of cake and only pours a little glass of milk, then he will, he'll pour like little increments of milk to match the cake. Mm -hmm. And for, I think over the years, it's just driven me crazy. Cause I, I, I think it's the ritual of it. Like, oh, you can't help yourself. But then, and then after you're done, you always cough. Mm -hmm. And that drives, and you know how I feel about coughing. I do not like coughing <laughs> because my mom has a, like a dry, my mom doesn't have like a consistent cough, but when she does cough, it's like this very specific like tone mm -hmm. that like is like nails on a chalkboard. So I think the combination of the ritual and the coughing, <laughs> but it's kind of funny to me because instantly, like if you give Nick, like it's not all sweets, like not gummy bears or. Oh yeah. No, like, uh, no, it'll be baked like goods. baked goods. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you give Nick a cookie, he's like, I mean, you could see him going for the refrigerator in slow motion. Well, the, the good thing about that, uh, that evil chemistry is that if we, if you have cake in the house and there's no milk, I, I will likely not eat the cake. Yeah. If he doesn't have access to milk, he will not, I mean, he'll try it, but he won't go hard because 
he needs milk. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of become a joke. Get him some milk. Yeah, that Nick <laughs> needs milk. Yeah. Um, oh, someone doesn't think Hallie's a strong actor. Shots fired. Oh, 68 was the tie with Barbara. London is falling. Um, oh, yeah, Academy Award actress Angela Bassett in London is falling with Gerard Butler just sounds wrong. That's what I'm saying. I think that her not being what, saddled with this moniker uh, had, you know, has allowed her to do what she wants to do. What is it in Olympus Has Fallen where she, her major contribution is Gerard Butler doesn't know, they're, they're like sharing some code and she's like, whatever the hashtag means or something. Oh, I don't even remember. <laughs> that's a very corny movie. Yeah. Angela was good in Waiting to Exhale. Oh, I mean, that's, but I mean, that's an iconic moment. But I think she's stronger than the movie. Yeah, for sure. Well, because Whitney. Poor Whitney. I don't think Whitney should. I, I know people didn't agree with our review when I said I didn't think she was. I don't think Whitney's the best actor. She's okay. She's not horrible, but when you have Loretta Devine and Angela Bassett just just so naturally working with the material, and even Lila Rashawn mm -hmm. adding so much of her personality to it, and then you have Whitney looking like stank. I mean, it, I mean, Thank it feels you. like she probably was like line, line, line. Let's just get through this chunk of dialogue so we can get on to the next thing. Um, it, that she was also miscast, I think, in The Preacher's Wife. Where, because it seems like she has no interest, no chemistry with uh, Angela's husband, <laughs> with, right? With Isn't Courtney, that, with Courtney, Courtney Vance. Vance. And I think she made comments like, "I just wouldn't be attracted to a man like that." Well, she yeah. said she didn't originally want the role because she didn't think a woman like her would be attracted to him. <laughs> and it's clear. It's Strange clear. Days has a good soundtrack. Jane, yeah, yeah, uh, Jane Goodall. That's right. I can remember. There was a there's a documentary about her. I've been meaning to watch, but yeah, she's still alive. Someone has been working on our back catalog um, and they uh, enjoy it. Oh, thank you. I know that oh, our, wow. our early videos did not have the best, uh, well, really anything because <laughs> the audio was not great. Yeah. And then I wasn't taking notes. Mm -hmm. So it was rough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my personality still shined through. I mean, it's rough now with notes. So you can imagine those early videos. <laughs> <laughs> um, Whoopi should have won for the color purple. Oh, someone else thought that uh, the same thing about Gorillas in the Mist. Oh, yeah, no, time for rewatch. I really thought Diane Fossey was some old white lady living somewhere drinking tea. I did, she got her head chopped off. No, and she, she again, she kind of lost her mind up there caring for those gorillas. Uh, Julie Harris is a nice supporting role. Um, Joseph is approved rotten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of Kerry Washington, um, I remember Joseph referencing the Kerry Washington School of Acting in one of your videos. <laughs> um, you know what it was? Watching so much scandal and her just being so... She's a very distinct way she moves her mouth. She and I think me watching Scandal, because I was in, I watched Scandal, I don't remember how I came upon it, but I watched it like, um, what's the word? I binged it. So it was a lot of her gums flapping. And I, like, it was just a lot at one, like in a long, you know what I mean? Like it was a lot of that mouth and face. <laughs> she does this quivering thing. She does have a distinct thing she does and it carries, it's notable. In every all, role. In every role. But she does this quivering thing with her lips, like for colored girls. It's when she's, I had a, I had VD. <laughs> Nick saying you're welcome to Joseph while sipping his Dean and DeLuca mug. <laughs> so disrespectful. Um, do you love Angela's performance in Rot and Strange Days? Yeah, she's my favorite part of that movie. I wish I had a movie brain like Nick. He's like a cinema encyclopedia. I'm mentally ill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not supposed to agree with that. Where does the person in the garden live? I'm in Arizona where you lucky your garden is not burnt up. Oh my God. I'm I saw on the news like the cactus plants in Arizona are dying from the heat. <laughs> Yeah. That can't be right. It's not right. Yeah. Someone thinks Bohemian Rhapsody is the worst biopic. It's bad. I haven't seen it. It's, I mean, yeah. the production on that was a mess too, to be fair, but. 
the performances elevate what's love got to do with it for sure oh, ella joyce angela bassett's great oh that yeah ella joyce is who i was thinking of uh, angela bassett was great in john sales movies like sunshine state yeah this you know so it's funny thinking 93 we, the way we think about angela bassett when just, I mean, I think she was in Passion Fish, which is a really good a supporting role, a good Sean Sayles movie uh, with Mary McDonald and Alfre Woodard. But in just in 1990, she has, she's got that, uh, basically a cameo as the flight attendant in Kindergarten Cop. Oh. So, you know. Her, yeah. What's your skincare routine? Lotion, water. Yeah, soap and lotion. <laughs> well, you know, this is there's lights in front of us. Uh, and I don't think this is HD, right? Mm. Yeah. If you saw me in real life, you might not feel the same way. That's not true. You um beautiful. I have an incredible vocabulary for a person who doesn't read a lot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sissy Spacek for in the bedroom. Spectacular performance. Oh, Sissy's good. Uh, you know what? I've been, it might be a, have to be a secret movie, but I've been wanting to rewatch. It's really depressing. Uh, Night Mother, where she's trying to kill herself, <laughs> her name Bancroft. You believe Angela uh, Robin could have done it? I think she could have. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think at the time, Robin Givens had a lot of uh, shine on her for something that wasn't her acting. Yeah. So I feel like it would have been it distracting. Yeah. yeah. Vanessa Williams is gorgeous, and it looks like she's had some work done. La Van Vanessa's too light-skinned to play uh, Tina. Oh, oh, is she supposed to? Vanessa L? Oh, are you oh, talking about Vanessa talking L Vanessa? or, or uh, Miss America Vanessa? Because I uh, I noticed in the last month or so, she's been posting more pictures, and I think she's had like a facelift, maybe. Essence Queen of the Universe? Yeah, oh. and I think she may have gotten veneers. She looks fantastic. She's beautiful. And it looks like she's lost some weight. Um, yeah, the David Bowie biopic was not good. Oh, the, Nina with Zoe Saldana. That was interesting. Get put you, you had to put a prosthetic nose on her and make her skin darker? I mean. Oh, Roseanne did an interview with Ike back in the day and called him out for being an abuser on live TV. Huh. I don't remember that. Oh, poor Roseanne before she also lost her mind. Oh, we saw uh, Jackie beat for her for her 60th birthday. Sexty. And uh, oh, I need to write that down. And uh, but she talked because Jackie beat used to write for Roseanne for a long time. But yeah, she was saying how it's unfortunate. She's sort of gone off the rails. Yeah. Someone loves our reviews. Um, I need to watch Jackie's back. Uh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Oh, they listen to our podcast. Yeah, you need to watch Jackie's Back. Right Here, Right Now by Fat Boy Slim. That wow. has uh, that has Angela Bassett's voice in it. Hmm. From In Strange Days. Oh. Um, God, Fat Boy Slim I used to listen to a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I lost my spot. Uh, you're, you're about right there. I don't like Carrie's overacting. <laughs> well, then I've seen, what else have I seen her in? Like she did that one movie where she's married to a white man and then their son is like mm -hmm. biracial. And and he might, the police are looking for him. That was a, I didn't like her in that. Television film. She's in for colored girls. Mm -hmm. Didn't think she added anything to that. Well, you never finished Django Unchained. She's oh, in Ray. No. Ray. What's on tap for the podcast? It's Joseph's turn. It's my turn. We're going to do um oh god, I just had a Mitch McConnell moment. Okay. <laughs> uh Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the 1990 movie. Okay. Right? So it's not so secret. Yep. Well, yeah. Well, for anyone who's watching the live, they'll know. For anyone who stayed this long, they get a little something. Uh -huh. um, I did not have a how to get away with murder phase. I don't think I've watched one episode of that. What would have made this movie a five? 
I think the lip syncing and then some of the storytelling is a little, I, I think the actors did a phenomenal job with the script, but I do think it could have been refined a little bit because there are some things that are a little unclear to me, like with the children, with well, yeah, with her describing the career she wants, but it doesn't quite match what we've seen her doing and then what she did. Like, I don't know why we even included that. To me, it would have just made sense to say, I want to be my own artist. Like, I want to have my own voice. But then they add in the fact that she wants to do a certain type of music and she, and she doesn't like what she did and neither of those things match. Felt funny, dried out bathhouse. Uh, Tony Goldwyn. Uh, yeah, he's aged quite well. He is in what's Opp the movie? Oppenheimer. Oh, he is an Oppenheimer. He looks great. But what's the movie where he's like, there are two serial killers, like bi coastal serial killers with Dennis Kiss the Girls, Morgan Freeman? Blech. He looks good in that. Oh, he no. looks good in everything. You know, we should rewatch Ghost. Oh, he looks good in Ghost. He's a bad guy in Ghost. I remember. I remember. The only thing I remember about Ghost is Tony Goldwyn. Oh. And, and Hoopy. I remember Hoopy. And like Oda Mae Brown. You don't yeah. have that sculpting. When she says you're in danger. You're in danger, girl. Um, have we seen The Stroll? No. I did. Oh, you did see The Stroll? Yeah, because it was uh, I covered Sundance from home. and We did start watching that gay serial killer series. Uh, super interested to, to, continue, to continue with that, yeah. Have we tried Idlewise Chocolate in Beverly Hills? No. Joseph doesn't like going into anywhere in Beverly Hills. Not that I do, but parking is difficult. Parking is difficult. I usually assume and it's expensive. I'm, for one Valentine's Day, I bought you that nice pizza from that place that Raquel Welch and Kathy Moriarty used to co-own. I forget the name of it. And you were like, never buy this again. No. And I like the pizza. No. If you want to send me a gift certificate, I'll go. But <laughs> Greetings from Sweden. Uh, hello, Sweden. <laughs> Warm cookies and cold milk. Yep. Oh, you yeah. like that. I do. And sometimes if I'm like just living with, in a state of reckless abandon, I'll eat that shit like cereal. I think watching you eat milk, like the way you has stopped me from drinking milk, because now I don't ever drink milk with like cookies or cake, but partially because like it'll force me to eat less. I think, because I already eat too much. Well, you're welcome. Oh, key lime pie. I do like key lime pie, which makes me think of Maria Bamford. <laughs> my key lime pie, your plate. <laughs> <laughs> Who took my key, I, key lime pie, your plate? I do like tres leches. Uh, Joseph, actually, of one of the few things he does bake, he'll, he has a thing he likes to make. I will make a tres leches mm -hmm. cake. Oh, and then I posted that meme about the Say Leches cake, and then someone wrote, not in this economy. <laughs> <laughs> um, food talk. All right, I had tacos three hours ago. Oh, I had a taco yesterday. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my mom made fried tacos, and then I brought some home. Very good. Um, but you do like the Leches. Uh, when we read each other, it's gold. I'm, I'm not trying to... Uh, I'm just... Who's afraid of Joseph Wolf, Wolf <laughs> the milk dilemma? <laughs> yeah, you act like I'm swilling booze over here. I have issues. It's just a little milk. Nick is rolling his eyes very loudly. I'm the same as Nick, but but with coffee or even tea. Well, it's just, that's a well, thing. you have a it's coffee a, addiction, too. It's just a texture thing. That's why, you know, biscotti, you can only eat biscotti with coffee or, or, or milk. But you got to dip that shit. You can't just crunch on that. Sure. Break your teeth. Oh, I never watched 911. I didn't Angela. either. TV's so hard to get through. Oh, one of the best kisses on film is Angela and Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes is also very handsome, mm -hmm. which I think is funny because he's in a man eater. No. What's the Hannibal Lecter movie he's in? A Red Dragon. Red Dragon, mm -hmm. where his character thinks he's like ugly. Mm -hmm. And it's like he's very good looking in that movie. <laughs> And all he has is like a little bitty Scott. Like, do you still update your video playlists? I don't know what that means. On YouTube? Yeah, every video gets categorized in its respective uh, playlist, if, if that's what you mean. Gums flapping. <laughs> you know, she does that thing with her, like. Yeah, she has a way of. Can you do it? Uh, she, she just has a way of moving her. <laughs> 
upper lip over her teeth. That, that and there's this tremble. There's a tremble. That, it, but she does it a lot. It bothers me. Whose idea was it to start this YouTube channel? Do you want to answer that? Because I, I don't remember. <laughs> I think it was joint Lee. Was it? Okay. Yeah. And we went and sat at that one coffee shop I like to go to. And that's when we first uh, came up with everything. There was a, a song I wrote that originally was going to be recorded at one point. We got news of the American heat wave and Swedish news. Uh, yeah, it's it's hot. I it mean, we hot. have air conditioning, so it's fine. Well, also, we live in the part of L.A. that doesn't get as hot. Uh, like, the valley is more like the desert. Mm -hmm. That's miserable. The, yeah, because we were in Palmdale last Because we drove week. to Palmdale last weekend. Was it last Saturday? Yeah. Oh, that's right. It was last Saturday. Oh, my God. I mean, we went to a pool party, so that was nice. But, like, drinking out in the heat? Mm -mm. I felt pickled. Well, you drank more than I did, but even I felt like the next day was rough. Mm -hmm. um, oh, my laugh is adorable. Mm -hmm. Speaking of 90s actresses, I used to love Teresa Randell from New Jack City and Girl 6. Yes, and I always think she kind of reminds me of... She reminds me... Teresa Randall reminds me of uh, Alfre Woodard a little bit. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, New Jack City's great. Uh, I've actually never seen Girl 6. It's I need to few, watch. It's one of the few Spike Lee films I haven't seen. We reviewed how Stella got her groove back, right? Yeah, we did a, a, podcast? a podcast on it. Yeah. yeah that's That know. movie was interesting because I thought Angela Bassett was too... She's too beautiful. She's too beautiful for everyone to be acting the way they are about her and Tay Diggs. Yeah. Tay Diggs is very handsome, but it's like Angela Bassett and then those ladies talking to her like she ain't shit. Like, mm, that doesn't make sense. Oh, they're gardening from their tiny patio in New Mexico. It was 118 the other day. Oh. Someone's saying we're handsome. Thank you. Okay. Um, I haven't eaten yet today. But we're glowing in our other videos. Well, we're also sitting in front of a lot of lights in the other videos, too. <laughs> I think my skin looks like looking at myself on the screen. It looks nicer than it is in real life. That's not true. You like Ray Fines and Red Dragon. <laughs> when I see myself in the rearview mirror when I'm driving, I'm like, ah! <laughs> it's all about lighting, darling. Watch Mariah Carey talk about lighting. Um, oh, look. blowout. Are we watching yeah. just like that? No. But we, well, we didn't watch Sex in the City. Well, you didn't. I didn't. I did with an old girlfriend of mine, but homegirl of mine, but. I don't have any connection to the material. I'm not actively avoiding it. It's just there's so much. Like, I, I got a sh shitload of Locarno screeners. Venice is coming up that I got to prep for. TVs. I, I, we're, we got to struggle through Los Al Flowers of Alice Hart. We have two more episodes left of The Flowers of Alice Hart. Okay, we need to get through all these. Uh, thoughts on Ridley Scott's Napoleon with Joaquin? I mean, I'll, I'll see it. I like Ridley Scott, but I think maybe it's a nostalgic factor because much like House of Gucci, why is he directing this movie? Robin Givens and Tempest Bledsoe are in an Expendables movie. I oh wait, is that with the uh, Sylvester Stallone? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? I've only seen the. F I feel like I've only seen the first Expendables. Okay, if Tempest Bledsoe and Robin Givens are in one of those, we need to watch that one. Turtles in a Half Shell. <laughs> Well, I really liked the new cart. Was that video out yet? No. Oh, out. shit. You, you put it out Monday. <laughs> oh, that's right. We're doing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for the podcast because the next day, the review for the new one comes out. Mm -hmm. But it's not a spoiler that I thought it was excellent because I put it on Rotten Tomatoes already. I gave it a four out of five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I gave it four and a half. You gave it four and a half. It's excellent. I loved it. Uh, yeah. Carrie Washington, the dead girl. I haven't seen it. For, is that Karen Moncrief? Fantastic cast, creepy movie. We need to watch some Ben Miller movies from the 80s. Well, you've never seen uh, The Rose. I've never seen The Rose. I've never seen Jinxed. Uh, I, I own The Rose. I've never seen For the Boys. I think that's her two Oscar nominations. I feel like we have to do a podcast about beaches. I've seen beach. Uh, I just, Criterion sent me one false move uh, for review, and I haven't watched it yet. Uh, starring Bill Paxton, but of course, directed by Carl Franklin. Uh, who did Out of Time with Denzel uh, and Devil in a Blue Dress, which I love that movie. You don't so much, but Carl Franklin's good shit. 
Thanks to Joseph's Rex, I finally watched 47 Meters Down in Open Water for Shark Week this week. Any more shark movie Rex? Um, there is a, I haven't told you about it yet, but we have a screener or I received a screener for a documentary called Shark Exploitation. Oh, if you're well, interested. definitely. You know, I like anything shark. Um, you know, another shark movie I'd recommend that I thought, um, I mean, it made me uncomfortable is uh, Dark Tide with Halle Berry. And uh, with her baby daddy. Uh, with her baby daddy. Well, Olivier, what's his name? Yeah, I would check. The, I recall the, like the second half being very tense. We drove to NoHo to see that at the Landmark, I think. Oh. The year it came out. What are our guilty pleasures? Well, Nick doesn't have any because he only spends his time doing. <laughs> you can't answer that question. What's your guilty pleasure? See? <laughs> He's not going to let anyone think he does frivolous things. I do. Um, I do frivolous things. I like watching um, things like Chasing Reality on YouTube like or on Tubi. There's another, like, Black, queer, young people, like, out here trying to hustle, making these, like, bootleg-ass reality shows. I love them. I love them. So that's my guilty pleasure. Uh, oh, someone made Puerto Rican flan. I'm not sure how that's different, I'm, but I bet it's delicious. But I'm, I'm curious about it, yeah. Okay. Um, Madonna, Naomi Campbell, and Deborah Wilson are in Girl 6. I know. I, I think that's one of those films I've held off on for like a moment to watch. Are we interested in watching Succession? I watched like the first three episodes. I'm interested. Again, I'm interested. It's just... I do like the Culkin guy in it. I like Brian Cox. So I, but I don't know that we're going to watch it. Are we going to review the new Dracula movie? We're going on tomorrow. Last Voyage of the Demeter. What are we seeing tomorrow? Passages. Oh, passages. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the, the Last Voyage of the Demeter Joe uh, next week. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't watched Shadrach with uh, Harvey Keitel. I like Harvey. Well, someone says now they only see movies while wearing a fish jelly t-shirt. Oh. I've seen Ruthless People. It's been a long time. Oh, okay. Um, we're both so funny. Thank you. The Rose is excellent. Oh, what's the Bette Midler movie with Richard Dreyfus? Oh, it's the remake of Boo Doo. It isn't Gary, o Gary Owen. Uh, no, Gary Busey in it or Nick Nolte. Uh, Down and Out in Beverly Hills. Down and Out in Beverly Hills. Yeah, I've seen that. That's a remake of the uh, Jean Renoir film. Do you know we live like a block away for, like from the Hollywood Forever Cemetery? And I drive by it every day. And I, I've only been there once in 12 years. I've never been. We, we, we did go. I haven't been there. We didn't go? No. Oh, so I've never been. I think we were planning on going, and then you're like, oh, the line. Yeah. I. Now that we could walk there, I might go. But it just has never. Well, I just don't like when, you know, the people line up like hours before because they want to get a good spot. I don't like that because I'm not doing that. So I'm going to show up right on time, and then they're going to put my ass in the back by the gate probably. So then it's like, and that screen is, you know. I might as well watch the shit on my phone if they're going to do all that. Like, <laughs> it's about the experience. Oh, but it's about being in. Company. There's Castaic Lake, which is like an hour north of downtown LA. They do movie um, screenings like on the lake, and there are different scenarios. Like, you can pay for a lawn chair to sit on the beach. You can pay for a private boat to watch the movie, and the boats aren't that expensive. It's like $250 and six people can fit on the boat. If I had four friends, I would, uh, <laughs> if I knew four people, I would go. But I think that sounds fun to rent the boat and then bring four people. And then you can bring food and they say you have to pay a corkage fee for alcohol, but you know, um, I think that would be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you like return to Oz? Oh, that is going to be. Isn't that part of a poll we were going to do? Yeah, I think you're going to do a Disney. Oh, that's our next poll. Mm -hmm. Our next poll is going to be like horror, like Disney horror films. Mm -hmm. I, but yes, I've so seen. So Watcher in the Woods, The Wizard of Oz, Return to Oz. 
I don't, there's one with Jody Foster on that list. I've not seen that. I'm very curious about, I doubt it'll win, but return to Oz. I, I like Feruza Balk and I think she's kind of creepy. Good casting as Dorothy. Oh, someone lives in Hollywood. So we're neighbors. Um, Four rooms. I've only seen once when I was a kid. I could rewatch it. The only thing I remember is Tim Roth on the phone being like, did you say an oven of witches? Thank you, Chris. Going on a date for the first time since I broke up with my ex of eight years. Any advice? I'm super nervous. Love your channel. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, well, sorry you broke up. I hope it's for the best. Well, I haven't been on a date in like 16 years, but uh, <laughs> so Same. I don't know. And I have an attitude, so I don't know that I'm the best. Well, um, to me, a date is about talking. Mm -hmm. So like going to a movie to me is like a horrible date idea. Going to like a trendy place um, where it's loud to me is or uncomfortable doesn't make sense. I think picking a, I think like a nice date to me would be getting like a cute bite to eat somewhere that's comfortable and then have a backup plan for if the date is going well then we can transition to another spot to get like a glass of wine or I think you need to plan like, like multi th multiple things to do mm -hmm. if it's going okay. well. And if it isn't, then this was a cute little dinner. I think somewhere not, I mean, I wouldn't be paying for dinner if I went on a date, but if you know, whatever you're, you think you're going to do, well, and, I wouldn't. And you I, didn't. <laughs> well, maybe now as a, uh, as a middle-aged man, I probably would have to, but um, yeah, I, I think it should be a series of things so that if the date doesn't go well, you don't feel bad. Cause some people plan super elaborate first dates. So then there's a lot riding on it. Mm -hmm. Just be, yeah. I, I think just simple. I um, think keep it cute, casual. I also think looking like comfortable is important. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you have to strike that fine balance of, listening and then being able to talk about yourself in a way that is appealing i yeah i think that's really important because i for me it's like oh i want to seem interesting in general but then i also have to remember that i don't want to suck all the air out of the room and like overtake a conversation so listening is important <laughs> and i think being upfront about you know what what you are kind of what, what you're really looking for because there's there might be really nice things about that person that you're responding to, but if you don't, if, if it's not going to kind of match your trajectory, like obviously you can evolve, but uh, I, I think it's good to put out there. What are your plans? What are your goals? What do you want out of life? What do you, what do you think a relationship should look like? I think, you know, I know typically people say, don't do that. Like, don't come on strong. I, I, I don't think that's coming being. No, not necessarily. But I think you need to take the temperature. Like, yes, because if, if this person is like, yeah, I wouldn't let you buy me another hot dog, then there's no point. Right. right. But so I think it's really about like, if we're connecting, just go with the flow. Yeah, I, I, I think you should just go with the flow. Mm -hmm. if, if you're feeling the person, then you need to have a backup plan. Like, OK, well, let's transition from this spot to another spot. See how that goes. I definitely don't think that, um, and I'm not a prude and I'm very sex positive, but I don't think people should be hooking up on the first date if you like them. I agree. So that's another bit yeah. of advice. Um, yeah, not, don't don't bring someone home on the first date. A bit, but not that there are If you want sex, go have sex with someone else that night. Yeah. But don't not with the person that you think you might like. I actually agree with that. <laughs> but not that there aren't successful couples that did, you know, hook up the very first moment they met. But I think there's something kind of exciting and thrilling and enigmatic about drawing that out for as long as you can, as long as you can, because the years you spend with this person, you have plenty of time to sleep with them. And then it becomes a different problem. Yeah. Because like, if someone had sex with me on the first date, it's like, Oh, they're clearly going to be into me. So then <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, you know, it's like, if you're, if like, if, if that's a good situation, then it's like, now they, that's what they like. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you really don't know me. Right. Cause if you did, you probably wouldn't like, me. <laughs> right. I mean, we're very uh, weird people, so I think weird, difficult, difficult people. I don't think Chris is weird. And, I, I, no, I, not to imply. I, I'm not implying you're weird and difficult. I don't, I don't wanna, we're not trying to project. I think you should put your your authentic self forward and go with the flow and have shorter things to do, but like multiple mm -hmm. if things are going well. 
And don't spend too much money. And somebody said, don't talk about your ex. That's good advice. Don't talk about your ex. Don't wear too much cologne. But and make sure your breath is fresh. But wear deodorant. And wear deodorant. I don't wear deodorant ever, but and I don't either. But, but that's because I'm not really well, whomever whomever is close to me in that way likes how I smell, but um and make sure your hands look nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big one. Look comfortable but nice, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't try too hard. Yeah. I don't like when people look like they really thought a lot about like this outfit and they're wearing their Gucci, whatever. Well, because I mean, I don't go on dates, but when we meet new people and they show up and it's like, you are trying real hard right now. Well, and you can tell when somebody's too much in their head, like just, uh, it's, and also quiet moments are okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this video is very long and I'm hungry. So thank you to everyone. Oh yeah. Don't order food with garlic. We went to a restaurant. Um, there used to be a restaurant in Beverly Hills on la cienega called the garlic the stinking rose stinking rose i think it closed i think they're closed too we have been there before but not on a date obviously i mean we people are on dates at the stinking rose and it's like ugh, can you imagine uh you know you'd have to go home after that like separately you can't <laughs> you know garlic also causes a lot of flatulence yeah I'm just saying yeah keep it clean maybe uh Sushi. Sushi seems like a good date food, right? Light and clean. Anyway, we have to go. That's the part on the breath sometimes, too. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to say? No. All right. Ta-ta.